right. Well, thank you all for coming to the fourth in our series of historical lectures for the 300th anniversary celebration. I'm Jean Birchman. I'm the chair of the committee. And we're really excited by the turnout and the response that we've gotten to these, um, to these lectures. And I know that tonight will be very interesting. And I will go quickly so we can get right to it. Um, but I do want to say that I think it's remarkable that in a town that was founded basically for the purposes of education, here we are, evidence that we're all lifelong learners still in Hawkington, coming out to learn more and more about our town. So I think that's a great message. Again, I want to thank you for coming, and I want to introduce to you Anne, Dr. Ann Matina, who is a professor uh, of communications at Stonehill College. She's also the chair of the communications department. She served as the chair of the anniversary celebration committee for four years, three years, a lot of years, and um, is kind enough to still be working with us on many of our events and is here tonight to talk to you. Her particular focus in her research is um, women mill workers. And so she, as you all know and have learned from our historical lectures, we had a lot of mills in this town at one time. And so she's going to tell us a little bit about what that experience was like. So please welcome Dr. Ann Matina. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jean. I, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, this topic is especially near and dear to my heart. A few years ago, I was uh, doing some work, some research, on uh, the Bread and Roses strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts, which some of you may be familiar with. It, it occurred in 1912. And historically, it's very important because the workers won which was not uh, the typical response to a massive labor strike like Bread and Roses. So the city of Lawrence um, actually did not celebrate it as, a, as an event in their history until probably the 1970s. Uh, they pretty much, uh, people who were either had worked in the mills during that time or descended from the folks that worked in that mills, never talked about it, which was kind of interesting. And it wasn't until uh, labor historians started to kind of interview people and talk to people who had actually marched that long winter um, and, and won this strike. It was a phenomenal experience. Well, so that was in 1912. And the centenary ex uh, anniversary of that strike, I was asked to do a book chapter. And the chapter that I did was on the explosions of strikes that took place across particularly Massachusetts but all of New England in light of the victory in Lawrence. Every town and city that had factories in Massachusetts, there were massive strikes. One of the biggest ones was right down the road in Milford. And I kept thinking, actually, it was at the Draper factory in Hopedale, but Mr. Uh, Governor Draper did not, uh, he ruled Hopedale with an iron fist, and he would not allow strikers to walk, to picket in front of the uh, building. He wouldn't allow strikers at all uh, in, in Hopedale. So they all picketed and marched in Milford, and Milford put up with this for a little bit of time until they finally passed a bylaw that said, you know, no more than five people on the street congregating at the same, same time. These strikes are so important to American history, but they're also not often talked about. They're not often uh, discussed in terms of you know, what it meant for workers, what it meant for the immigrants who were working in these factories, what it meant to their quality of life, their overall experience as new Americans and then first and second generation Americans. But I was really, my curiosity was piqued because I couldn't ever find anything about Hopkinton. I thought, I know there were shoe factories here. I know there were mills here. I, I just can't imagine with this you know, wave of strikes across Massachusetts, where was Hopkinton in all of this? Well, what I came to find out was that this uh, Hopkinton's industrial age was basically over by 1912. Not completely, 
not completely, but all the uh, shoe and boot mills were gone by that particular time. There were only a few uh, factories left in town uh, by 1912. So this, as I said, intrigued me and I started to get interested in, well, what was life like prior to uh, the, the decline of the boot factories in Hopkinton? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Before I actually, before I begin, I, I would like to say that uh, I had a lot of help with this from Linda Connolly at the Hopkinton Public Library and also someone who she's working here at the Historical Society to organize files and um, to get things in place so researchers can have access to this wealth of information that's right across the hall from us about Hopkinton's past. And, and Linda also turned me on to a couple of sources that I had no idea that existed, and I, I'm going to share those with you this evening. So the overview that we're going to talk about this evening, just the, the birth of the shoe industry in Hopkinton, um, the smaller shops and mills, the larger manufacturers, the coming of the Irish, um, the strikes in labor organizations, because even though they weren't here in 1912, they certainly were taking place in the la latter half of the 19th century. Um, and then, because I believe that history is best told through people's individual stories, what I've done is I've chosen some representative workers and done a little uh, genealogy on them, uh, did some research in contemporary newspapers from, the, from when they were uh, working in Hopkinton to see what I could find out about their lives and try to give us a stronger sense of who these people were. Um, and then we'll conclude at, after that. And I certainly welcome questions. I don't know why this little thing will not just clean here. So the early days of uh, the shoe industry, most of you probably know this history. Uh, Joseph Walker is credited, uh, a Hopkinton resident, with using pegs to attach the sole and the uh, leather together on shoes, uh, wooden pegs. That was uh, a great advancement in shoe, the shoe industry, because prior to that, people sewed everything together, hand sewn. They continued to do that, but the shoe peg was a, a, a really major advancement. He had a shop of his own on Hayden Row after uh, 1926. Uh, we also know that Samuel Davenport, who we're going to talk about again in a few minutes, had a shop on Hayden Row on 1836. But in fact, there were shops all over town. They were all over town. Chestnut Street, Lumber Street, Main Street, Wood Street, and on what was then known as Whitehall Pond. Um, Lee Claflin, who we're probably all familiar with that name anyway, he was father of the governor, born here in Hopkinton in 1791. He actually uh, started a shoe business in Milford, but then moved it here to Hopkinton in 1840 and he opened a shop on Hayden Row at that time. One of the sources that Linda shared with me that uh, is just a fascinating thing is the uh, Journal of Samuel Dexter Wales. And this particular journal was kept in, uh, in the 1840s and 1850s. Samuel Dexter Wales lived outside of the center of town because throughout this journal of his, he makes reference to getting the horses together, the carriage together, and coming into the town center. I think he may have lived in Woodville, just through the description of what he was saying. It was actually found, the original was actually found inside the hall in a farmhouse in Maine. How it got there, nobody knows. Nobody knows. So, um, but it, it came to Hopkinton, and as I said, Linda's been working on this, and she tr got someone to transcribe it, and she edited it, and she shared it with me, because one of the things that he talks about quite a bit at this time period is, actually talks about a lot. It's an incredible window into Hopkinton life in the 1840s and 50s. But one of the things he talks about is working on boots and shoes. During this time period, people would 
take the boots and shoes home. They would come from a factory. He mentions going to Thompson's and getting shoes and bringing them back to his home and finishing them at home. And then they would turn them in for money at when they at at um, you know once once they got them finished. Okay, so it was a home-based. Uh, kind of industry, it's not until a little bit later that we start to see the big factories that we're all familiar with from those pictures. So one, the other thing he was very interested in, he went to lectures all the time. He went to temperance lectures, he went to anti-slavery lectures, uh, mostly temperance more than anything. He writes in detail in almost every one of his entries about the weather, about his physical state, including things we really don't need to know about, okay? <laughs> even 150 years later. And then he writes about the meetings he's heard and the speakers he's heard. So um, he was very active. There was a very, very active temperance and anti-slavery society here in Hopkinton at this time period. But he also then puts in, kind of weaves into his discussion about what's going on in the boot industry, boot and shoe industry at the time. And I love this quote up here. I'm sorry that you were not seeing the whole thing. But he basically says, after talking about an anti-slavery meeting, the interest in the course of freedom is very small here. Boot business is good and all are busy making, their mo making the most of it. It seems to be a trait in human nature to forget their downtrodden fellow mortals in the heyday of flesh and prosperity. Um, again, it, we, we get a real sense of what it was like. He balanced so many different things. He farmed, he delivered milk, he would go and get boots and bring them home and finish them. And, he, it's kind of sad towards the end of his life. As you can see, he, he died, he was uh, just about 40 years old, a little past 40 years old. It, towards the end of his life, he was struggling financially. And he mentions in the journal trying to borrow $2 or $5 from friends who would not give, give it to him. And he couldn't understand that. Um, he couldn't understand why that was the case. And, and in the, that time period, it's the late 1850s, or mid to late 1850s, he talks about how down the business is, how down the shoe business is in town, and that he's not getting work. Well, here's Lee Claflin. Um, as we know, he, as I said, he brought, the, he brought a business here in 1840. Um, he was the father of William and uh, Wilbur, who are also, at, uh, Wilbur especially is active in the uh, shoe and boot industry. This is the house that William built for him, number eight, Hayden Row. William, the governor, his house is at the corner of Park and, and um, Hayden Row, you know, the uh, Dockstetter's house that we are familiar with, which was, if you've never seen the original house, you should check out the picture in the library. It was fabulous. It just went on for the entire block. But his son built him this house um, on Hayden Row, and it still stands today. The houses that are next to it, it's a blue side-by-side -side duplex, um, was built for the servants in Claflin's house, which is kind of interesting, that they had their own house. So here's a little, this is a little bit of, um, from the 18, oops, sorry, 1875 map here. You can see, um, this is a Claflin boot shop on Hayden Row. Right here, this is right at the split with Grove Street, okay? Um, you can see it, oh, sorry, down here. It's a little bit further down. That's, that's the house, and this is where the boot shop is. Um, this is, again, this is a little bit hard, hard to see, but from this time period um, on Ash Street, we have the cider mill, the Eames cider mill on Ash Street. We have W.A. Phipps boot shop right at the intersection of Chestnut, right over here, Chestnut and Hayden Row. And then down here, this is the Bowker area down here, um, down near College Street, and we have a McCarran shoe shop, and we also have um, a carriage shop here as well. 
So that's just a little bit of, the, you know, there were dozens and dozens of these places around town. Um, as I said, eventually, uh, they moved from the home into the factories, and we started to see the growth and the building of these much larger uh, boot manufacture, manufactories, is what they call them. I'm not going to talk about every single one of them. I just want to give you a sense of what they looked like if you haven't seen these pictures. This is C.A. Claflin's. Is that building still around? No, none of these buildings are as far as I know. And this is Samuel A. Crooks and Company's boot manufactory, and we're going to talk about his employees um, in, a, in a few minutes. But this one is, I'll show you right here, it's the Davenport's block. And that was named for that man who, as I earlier s referred to, he had a shop on Main Street in 1836. It's where Main Street Auto is, at the corner of Mount Auburn and Main. So this was the, as, um, as I said, that was Crooks. It changes hands a few times. One of the more interesting things I think about all of this is all of this, the, the owners of all these factories um, bailed each other out all the time financially. They took on partners with each, they were partners with each other. They um, intermarried, their families intermarried all the time. Um, they were the leading citizens of the town. Um, and they formed a, a pretty tight bond, a pretty tight community. As a matter of fact, they're the people who started the Hopkinton National Bank, which was on the corner of Hayden Row in Maine. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, they financed it themselves, which was typical in the 19th century. It was all of these men who did that. They also were, some of them, very active in the anti-slavery movement as well. We should point that out. So here's Samuel Crooks, and here is, oh, and here is his home. Sorry. This is kind of hard to do with the, with the mouse here. And the, here is his home. And most of you will recognize it as uh, Dr. and Mrs. Wright's house on Hayden Row. And it's a, a one of the you know, a finest mansions of its time when it was built. And we're lucky that we still have it. We still have a few of these homes, which is great. Okay. This is the DT Bridges, Daniel Thurber Bridges Company. Um, Bridges and Company's boot manufactory, which was right on Main Street, where, where the town hall is. And these are all before electricity? Yes. And there's no mechanical things going on? There's no running water? There's no power. running water in here. I think it's steam. If I was to take a guess, I would say it's steam. And by the Coburn's Coal? I think so. I think that's probably what it was. Um, here's a picture. Some of you probably have seen this picture. This is kind of a famous picture of the Bridges boot shop with all the workers out in front of it. And it says 1876, and the shop burnt in, uh, down in, eight, in the fire of 1882, which was the most damaging fire of the three major ones we had in town. Um, and the 1876 date, I would guess, that this is around the 4th of July. There were many, many centennial celebrations for, you know, the, the uh, celebrations of the 100th year anniversary of the founding of the con country. And one of the things that I hope you can see, you probably can't see so much, but if you, if you ever get a chance to see this, this is on the library's website on their digital images uh, uh, from the treasure room. You can really take a closer look at this, how many kids there were that worked in the factories. And up here in the windows, these are young women. There's many young women in the front and kids in the front. So kids over here as well. And as you see, it says the first town hall, okay, right next to it. So here's Daniel Thurber Bridges. He was born in Bellingham in 1827. He married a Hopkinton girl, Frances Wadsworth. Frances Wadsworth grew up in the Stone House on East Main. Her father built, or her father built that house. Um, they had, I think, six or seven children, and they also raised one of uh, uh, his, her nieces, Eliza Wadsworth. 
McMechan Bridges, and someday I'm going to do a lecture just about Eliza. She was a lawyer, in, and she practiced law. She was, a town, she was the town council here in Hopkinton in the 1920s. So we'll talk a little bit about, we're not going to include her tonight. One of these days I'm going to have an opportunity to talk to her, talk about her. He moved the whole factory, he moved every, well, the factory burnt down. He moved his business to South Framingham after the second fire in 18, 1882. Um, and he died there in 1898. His kids, many of his kids were still around in town. Um, the family still had, there are still uh, descendants of the family in town and of the Wadsworth family in town. So that's kind of exciting as well. Um, here's the E.A. Thompson. Boot Manufactory. This is on the corner of Maine and Grove. Yeah, yes. These buildings look really big. That, well, I can actually give you the dimensions of them. Most of them were three or four stories, and they were, you know, maybe uh, 40 feet by uh, eight, you know, 400 feet or something like that. Some of them were giant. I mean, certainly that Bridges factory was huge. They would have anywhere from four to eight hundred employees in a given at any given time. Um, one thing that we should note too is the boot business was seasonal. This was seasonal. People did not these didn't run three hundred sixty-five days a year, even when they became mechanized. Um, <laughs> it's not until much later in the nineteenth century that they start to you know, run every day and, and run in that way. And that's one of the things that's so frustrating to the workers, especially in the 1870s and 80s, when the labor uh, movement starts, comes to Hopkinton. Because the workers cannot, uh, they can't depend on, on a, uh, their, a regular pay. So uh, they all do kind of what Samuel Wales did earlier on, which is they grow their own food, they find work in other places, and then they come back to the shop when the shops are hiring again. And this is not unusual. The, the uh, garment industry in New York City was exactly the same way. Everybody would get laid off, and then they'd all be called back in. And it's not until the unions take over and really start negotiating that they start to even this stuff out so that you have a regular paycheck. Um, so here's, here's E.A. Thompson, corner of Grove in Maine, as I said, and his house, which we're all very familiar with. Again, it's the Erastus Thompson house right next to the Gourmet on Main Street. Um, he started a shoe shop on the upper floor of a store located where the town hall is now. Um, eventually, he built his factory, and he sold it to Claflin and Coburn in 1892. There's also evidence that Daniel Thurber Bridges was a partner in Claflin and Coburn as well. Even though he was over in Framingham, this, they, they kind of had a monopoly on this, uh, on, on all of these. They, they owned them all together. Now, when I said about them all Oh, we'll talk about, talk about first. Um, I, can't, I couldn't find a picture of this. Um, the G and F W Wood Shoe Shop in Woodville. It opened in 1867 on Wood Street. It had 40 employees, and in their first year of business, they turned out 1,200 cases of hand-sewn, completely hand-sewn shoes. Um, in 1870, they bought the stone building where their father had manufactured cotton. It's one of the earliest cotton mills in, uh, in the United States. was started by their father, Captain Wood, who Woodville was named for, in the early 1800s. They bought the building from him. It was on Whitehall Pond, and so then they were able to use water power. And by 1877, they, they were turning out 1,100 pairs of shoes a day. So they went from 1,200 cases in a year to 1,100 pair in a day. Um, in 1896, that got bought, they, they were no longer involved in it. It got bought out, and it became the Woodville Shoe Company. And for a while, it was the only remaining shoe company in town. Um, in 1906, which is a short 10 years later, the Barnard and Briggs Motor Car Company took over that building. 
and uh, maybe someone from the Historical Society or from Woodville can tell us what happened to the building. I don't know what happened to the building. Yes. Okay. Oh. Okay. 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 So, so the original was taken down. The carriage company. The carriage company. Okay. We. I. Yeah. We, we heard some about that as well in here. With this growth in industry and the mechanization of the wood of the shoe factories. They obviously need workers. Uh, Hopkinton was a small town, a couple of thousand people in the 1850s, uh, and they needed workers. And they, uh, they found a ready-made workforce it, with, from the um, famine immigrants from Ireland. Now, I didn't find any specific um, testimony to this in my research, but I know this is true out in Western Mass in the paper and textile mills out in Western Mass during this time period. The owners of those factories in Holyoke, Chicopee, and Springfield actually sent ships to Ireland to bring back whole families to work in the mills. So. Uh, something is telling me that that wouldn't have been unusual for Hopkinton to have done at that time. So in 1846, there were 22 Irish families in town. Uh, on the 1860 census, there were 1,285 individuals born in Ireland on our census, out of a total of 4,360. So fully a quarter of the town was Irish born at that time. I have just an excerpt from the um, 1860 census, uh, census here. We have the Patrick Murphy family um, uh, with three kids at the time who's a bootmaker, the Patrick O'Connor family also a bootmaker. And if you look at the census, you just see over and over and over families just like this. A decade later, all of these kids will be working in the mills. Okay, in 1870, they'll be all working in the mills. Okay. So, um, one of the things is, is we, we don't have to, enough time to go really into this about the difficulties for the Irish assimilating in the community. I mean, this was a, a very solid, staunch, Yankee, Protestant community. However, there were people who uh, did want to make the Irish feel welcome and try to at least um, acknowledge some of the differences, cultural differences, and probably one of the strongest ones at this time period was uh, the lack of a Catholic church. Most of the people in the town would go to Milford. Um, Milford didn't have a church for a long time either, a Catholic church for a long time either. Uh, eventually, someone would come, a priest would come once a month and say a mass here. People would go to other towns to get married by a Catholic priest. Um, and it's not until the 1860s that St. Malachi's is built on Cedar Street across from where the, live, uh, the post office is. Um, now, m of course, many of us know the story of St. John, and we know that St. John's was built um, because St. Malachi's was falling apart, basically. It was not structurally sound. It's actually, um, I think that's mostly wood. And uh, people wanted to build a, you know, build a substantial church. And if you look at St. John now, you know what an incredible feat that was for these mill workers to raise the funds to build that magnificent church. The other thing about that church is that it, what some people don't know is they started to build it and there was a financial collapse. There was a financial collapse and they had to stop building the church. And it was oh, almost a decade before they could restart the building on St. John's. Prior to that, they did have a basement and it's still there, the basement. You can still go to mass in the basement. 
Um, they did start saying mass in the basement of the building, um, but it's not until much later that uh, they start to, you know, that they are able to, an another priest comes in, another pastor comes in, they can raise the money again, start raising money, start building again. Um, and it was the pride of all Irish immigrants and their, and their uh, generations after them in the Metro West area, that particular church. There's great articles that have been written about when it finally opened and the bells pealing in town and the community you know, coming to them. I will mention, as I said, there were people who, who were reached out to the Catholics. Um, there were people who gave, uh, gave land. Uh, Will, I think it was William Claflin uh, who gave the land uh, for the cemetery on Mount Auburn. Um, and, and also a Protestant uh, business owner gave the land on Cedar Street for St. Malachi's as well. And I should say too, um, they are now in the process of repainting the inside of St. John's. If you haven't been in there lately, you should check it out because they're bringing back a lot of those really wonderful uh, details that were there. Uh, we don't have too many town directories from that time period, but there's one in 1886 that you can look at, and it says where people worked, and some of them were working in Milford at that time. It's more likely they were in Milford than Framingham. Yeah. And, and, well, and the Civil War, of course. Did you get to Milford with the wagons? And yep, and carriages, absolutely. And the, and, and the train, too, there was a train and um, the train was, uh, the depot was right next to Davenport's on Main Street. That's where the depot was. Um, it, but at this particular time, you know, as I said, the Irish come in, um, the working conditions are terrible, as they are in all factories in, across, uh, you know, the United States at that time. There's no laws about anything, about child labor, about how long you can work. You know, there's no, no laws about the length of a work day or what you can get paid or, you know, health benefits or any of the things we all take for granted. You work at the, you know, pretty much at the behest of whatever the owner says. And because Hopkinton is so tight-knit, very much like Lawrence. Lawrence is much bigger, but they have the wool factories. They actually have what they call a combination. And it's all the owners. They get together. They set prices. They say what they're going to pay. They're going to blacklist people who complain. So you might not like work your job at Crooks. And if you, you know, cause trouble at Crooks, Phipps is not going to hire you. And neither is Coburn because, as I said, they're all, you know, related to each other. And they all work together to keep the industry going. Um, in, in, to their advantage. Um, it's the capitalist way. It's the capitalist system. But this doesn't mean to say that there wasn't labor activism in town. The first strike I could find um, any evidence for, for is in 1859. So we're probably a decade into the um, uh, Irish being here. The Irish famine lasted most of the decade of the 1840s. Uh, so most people were here, you know, mid, by the mid-1850s. Um, they struck because of a reduction in their wages. Not much more information about it, but the town struck. Everybody was on strike. So again, it talks, it, it speaks to that idea of all of these things being connected with one another. In 1870, there was another one in Crooks, and we're going to talk about that one, which went into the 1871 um, with Coburn and Phipps Company and the Crispins. The Crispins are one of the first labor organizations in the United States, one of the earliest, the Knights of St. Crispins. And they were a secret labor organization. People were members, but you did not make that membership known publicly. And they had a, a particularly violent incident with uh, Coburn and Phipps. Um, in 1879, the Lasters, who were a particular, you know, particular skill, demanded five cents more a case, a case, five cents more a case, and they went out on strike. 
1886, the finishers at Coburn's demanded a 25 cent raise, okay? And the girls, which is how they were always referred, no matter what their ages were, um, in the cutting room at Thompson's also demanded an advance or a raise. Um, in 1894, Coburn's cut wages 10%. And they were promised the workers that they would reinstate them to their original wages once business picked up again, and they didn't. So uh, what happens is a strike, and in 1895, Coburn's moves to Wolfboro, New Hampshire, leaves town completely. So by this time, most of the boot and shoe factories are gone. There's still a few remaining, but by 1895, when the Coburn's moved to w Wolfboro, there was a regular uh, notice in the Milford paper, which is really interesting, of who was going from Hopkinton to Wolfboro to work for, uh, for Coburn's. The other thing that there was notice about, um, some of you may remember the picture, and I should have put it in here and I forgot to, the picture that Michelle put on the um, announcement for, for my talk tonight, the picture of all the workers' cottages around uh, Lake Whitehall, not only did some of they tear some of those down because they didn't need them anymore, some of them were just moved lock, stock, and barrel to Milford. They were just moved. They were sold and moved um, it, because Hopkinton didn't need them anymore. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. This is really. How long did the strikes last? The strikes could last a few weeks or a few months. The one in 1870 went into early 1871, and that's the one we're going to talk about in one second. Okay. Because that one was uh, pretty violent. Here we have the Knights of St. Crispin, which as I said, was one of the largest and, and uh, ones in Hopkinton, uh, or in the United States until that time. It was actually founded in Milford in 1864, and the guy who came up with the idea, an Irish boot maker, um, went, to, um, went to Milwaukee, moved to Milwaukee, and that's where it really flourished. But then he sent agents back here to form locals, and Hopkinton had a thriving local of the Crispins. And um, this is the Knight of, Knights of St. Crispin's. They are the, St. Crispin was the patron, patrons of the gentle craft is what it says here. Again, it was secretive. You couldn't tell anyone you were in it. They had really strict rules and lots of rituals. One of the rules that they made everyone swear by is that they wouldn't train any new workers in their job unless they knew they were members of the Crispins which drove the owners crazy, okay? The owners, of course, did not want anything to do with this organized labor. They were afraid of it. They didn't want any trouble. Um, and the idea that uh, a seasoned veteran would not train a new apprentice unless he could prove that he was me a member of the union was uh, you know, something that really was a bone of contention between the owners and the workers. Now, um, the other thing, too, is, so, so they have this, and it wasn't just the Knights of St. Crispin's. I couldn't find any evidence of it, but throughout Massachusetts, there were many chapters of the Daughters of St. Crispin's, because so many women worked in these mills, especially in Lynn. Lynn, as you know, was also a thriving uh, boot and shoe community, and the Daughters of St. Crispin were very active there. Lynn, Haverhill, Brockton, but I couldn't find any evidence of the Daughters being here in Hopkinton. So in 18... Oh, so um, the Knights of St. Crispin, order number four. Um, the one thing that I could find said there were 300 members here in Hopkinton. In 1870, R.M. Fay of Hopkinton was elected president of the Massachusetts Knights. I could not find anybody named R.M. Fay on the census. It could be Richard M. Fahey, who was a bootmaker. He lived at 75 Hayden Row. The house is still is there. It's still there. Um, the porch is gone from the front of it. It's now a, a, an apartment building. But um, that was the house uh, a few years back. 
So I think it was he that was the president. So Hopkinton had the president of the Knights living right in town. So they were um, very active here. So late 1870, early 1871, uh, the state militia are called to Hopkinton because uh, the workers at Colburn are out on strike and they're picketing. And picketing at this time period was not, you know, a nice line of people walking around with, you know, signs. They may have had signs, um, but generally speaking, it was, you know, just groups of men for the most part, sometimes women out on the streets. Generally what they would be doing is jeering at people who were going into the factories, calling them scabs. Um, you know, generally milling around in the streets. And it was not unusual at all for the state militia, the state police to be called as soon as the workers went out on strike. They would just call them in immediately. Get, this, get these people under control. We don't want them out on the streets like this. So it was a tough battle. It was over the holidays. It was January. There was no concessions on the part of, um, of Coburn. And some workers began to wor return to the shop, okay? Uh, three strikers try to stop them from entering and are shot, they're shot by an engineer from the Phipps Company who, who later claimed self-defense in his trial. What he says is, is that they were coming toward him in a group and he was frightened by them. Now it's really interesting because he, he did get arrested, but he never went to trial. He said what his thing was. And within a couple weeks, he was right back in his position as engineer at Phipps. Um, however, the, uh, the, which, is, which is really interesting, and it's kind of hard to piece this up together. It's something I'm going to keep working on. The names of the three strikers that were in the papers were Phipps, so, I mean, there were a lot of them in town. Obviously, this was not someone who was, work, you know, related to an owner, probably was, but was, was a worker. Harney and Lahaney. And again, I couldn't find, and I don't know who the Phipps was because there's no, there's, there's too many Phipps on the census to figure out which one it is. But the Harney was a man named uh, Barnard, Barnard Harney, and he was a shoe worker. He was a boot, a boot maker. Um, Jeremiah Long was the only one who got in, in any kind of, uh, served any time for this. He was a worker and he got uh, three months for throwing stones at the militia. So that was the only one. Okay. And somebody else can, uh, the story I heard was that the kids would throw the stones at the trains that were going through town and the trainmen would throw the coal at them, back at them. And then the kids would gather all the coal and bring it home. Um, and it, so it was kind of a game, and it went on for a long time. I don't know how true that is. It could be one of those urban legends. Stones but stones to try to dig a garden. Yes, the stones everywhere. <laughs> I wanted to share this with you. This is just part of a, uh, an article that's actually from the New York Times in 1873 about the Massachusetts Crispins. Three or four years since, the Knights of St. Crispin, a secret organization of shoemakers, was very powerful all over the country, especially so in Massachusetts, where by a succession of threatening and compulsory, compulsory movements, it kept the shoe trade in a state of great disorder. It was generally believed to have much more rigid discipline among its members than ordinary trade unions. Acts of violence occurred frequently in connections with its operations, and some were very atrocious cases were brought home to it. It is not too much to say that the society's rule was one of terrorism, uh, and that it did more than any similar society has ever done in this country to bring discredit on trade unions. They talk about the downfall of the Crispins in the 1870s, yet there is a, a man from Hopkinton who in 1889 writes a letter to the editor of the Boston Globe and says, we haven't gone anywhere. He's a Hop the Hopkinton Crispins were still in existence in the late 1880s, which is kind of interesting. They, 
The boot and shoe workers eventually, the, as a whole, the Crispins merge into the Knights of Labor, which again is, it's probably the one more people are familiar with. It's a, a big, you know, trade union organization in the 1870s, 80s. It's also secret. Um, so they merge in, into it. I came across this guy. This is a, he's kind of interesting. We've had a few famous former shoe workers in Hopkinton. One actually became the governor of Michigan, which is kind of interesting. Pingree, his name was. He, he was a, shoe, a, a boot maker in Hopkinton. Um, but this guy, Richard Griffiths, was his name. He was born in Scotland. He had this really colorful life all over. He, he was a sailor. He visited all these different uh, countries, exotic places. Somehow or another, he ended up in Hopkinton in the 1850s and 60s and learned the shoe trade. Um, he moves to Chicago, and where he rises to power in the Knights of Labor. He's the national vice president of it. His official title is the General Worthy Foreman of the Order. Okay, it's pretty, quite a handle for someone, right? General Worthy Foreman of the Order. When he dies in the 1890s, every newspaper in the country covered his death. He was anti-socialist, he was anti-anarchist, he believed in the gentleman's bargain, he believed that you should negotiate uh, with everyone, he was not someone who advocated violence, um, he, you know, so he's, he's uh, someone who's, this, the philosophy of the Knights is somewhat different, uh, of the Knights of Labor is somewhat different than the Crispins. It's like life like in the shop, inside the shop. Here's a picture that is right here um, for in, this, in Hopkinton Historical Society. You can see uh, men standing inside with the racks of boots. Uh, several of them have on long aprons indicating, you know, different positions. They're all smiling, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> this is from later. This is the 1890s. These are the male employees of the Crooks, s &A Crooks Company, posing for a photograph out in front, again, in the 1890s. How can they be shipping thousands of pairs of boots out of town for decades, which, you know, I mean, they, that, they were a major, this was a major manufacturing company. The s &A Crooks Company, this company, was at one time the third largest boot manufacturer in the United States. And some say that it might have been the second largest one. So um, here, again, here's some more workers from Crooks. This one has uh, women in the front of it. And children. There they are. I did find, um, it, we're going to talk about a couple of these people. Here's a little close-up of the women. One of this particular photo has some names attached to it. But even though they're numbered, you can't, they, they don't correspond to anything on the photo itself, OK? So um, you see Elijah Frail, great-grandfather of Nelson McIntyre, various names, um, Ada Gassett. Uh, who lived on Main Street with her father, Ira, Mary Murtaugh, okay? And then it says Blank O'Connell Murtaugh, Virginia Kenney's mother. Many of you probably remember Virginia Kenney. Um, her mother's name was actually Catherine. Her mother's name was actually Catherine. And she was married to James Murtaugh. So I found out a little bit about Mary. Um, she was actually born here in Hopkinton in 1870. She was a twin. Her twin sister, Bridget, um, did not ever work in the mills. She worked as a clerk in various places around town. But Mary worked as a shoemaker, a shoe worker. She was a stitcher, is what she was. She was the daughter of James and Margaret. They lived on Mount Auburn Street. And in all the research, I can't find a house number anywhere. Um, I, I think it was the last house on the left at that time. That's what I could tell from, from a map, but I can't actually figure out which house it was. She was president of the Ladies Auxiliary of the Ancient Order of the Hibernians, which was the Irish organization um, you know, that was uh, uh, very prominent in the late 19th and through the 
middle of the 20th century. The Hibernians are still around, um, but Hopkinton had an active chapter of them, and Mary was president of the women's auxiliary. Her father, James, was a bootmaker for A. Coburn and Son, and as I said, her brother, James, married Catherine O'Connell. Um, you can't really see it. Um, but they lived with, uh, James and Catherine lived with her parents at 16 Maple Street. James was the Hopkinton postmaster from 1916 to past 1932. He was, he was appointed every four years from 1916 to 1932. So one of the things that we see is after the shoes factories and the, and the other you know, mills leave Hopkinton, those people who stay, you know, what are some of the positions that they work their way into? For many of the Irish women, for the unmarried women, of course, it was teaching. It was teaching or clerking. Um, women were not secretaries in those days. Secretarial positions were for men at the turn of the last century. Um, some of them went to work, as we said, in Milford and Framingham. But James was the postmaster in Hopkinton Center. He was the Hopkinton Center postmaster. Um, so Alicia Frail, Elijah Frail. Um, was also mentioned in that picture. He was born, he's, he's a, you know, a native uh, of, to Hopkinton in 1835. He was married to Ellen Ball, who was of the, the very famous Valentine family, in the Valentine family a tree in history, which is massive. There's like 800 pages of it, it's online. Um, and they're in there together. Um, he, uh, again, worked at Crooks, and he lived at Seven Summer Street, for a period of time, and then he moved to 29 Ash. Um, he died in about 1921 in Newton. I don't, again, he left town. Um, there were other frails still in town, some, perhaps his children, but he moved to Newton. Dennis J. O'Brien, he was born in Ireland about 1846. He married uh, Mary Trilligan. In Hopkinton, he, widowed, he was widowed and remarried Joanna Carroll. He was an edge trimmer. He was also the local representative for the Knights of Labor here in Hopkinton. Um, he lived at 35 Grove Street, and sometimes he lived at 33 Grove Street. I don't know whether he just went back and forth, or there was just, you know, sometimes it was recorded as 35, and sometimes it was 33. Um, his daughter, Mary, was also a shoemaker, which again was fairly common. As I said, so many of these people, whole families worked, worked in the mill. He was appointed, he's another one, he was even earlier than James. He was appointed postmaster of, in Hopkinton in 1895, and he became an, a town assessor in 1907. is a familiar name to many of us in town, and this picture may be familiar to us as well. Michael F. Danahy, he was born in Ireland in 1840. He married in 1860 in Boston. However, at that time, he, on his marriage record, it does say he was living in Hopkinton. He just got married in, in Boston. He enlisted in the Navy in 1863. He served in the Civil War for several years. He sh served on three different ships. Um, he was a landsman on a gunboat. And he worked at both Crooks and Thompson's Boot Factory. He lived on Mount Auburn. And, no, I think I got that wrong. I think he lived on Commonwealth. It was a Murtaugh's outlet. He lived on Commonwealth. Com Commonwealth? I think it was Commonwealth. Um, but again, I couldn't find the house number. He had many kids as well. And most of them worked in the, in the uh, shoe, fa shoe factories. There are several Danahy families at that time period. Um, I, I tried to trace it so I could say to you, and here's where Dale Danahy comes from. <laughs> but I kind of got stuck and after 1930, and, and, uh, but I, I, you know, I'm sure she probably has that, or the family has some of that. Well, uh, this Danahy is a Michael Danahy. Right. It, it's a, was a professor at, at UMiss, mm -hmm. and he has traced the entire family. He has. And all of the Danahy's in Hopkins are all related. 
Okay. Well, it only makes sense that they would be. It, yeah. It's just sometimes kind of hard to, to, it's like looking for an O'Brien in, in here. You're, you're never going to straighten it all out, you know. Um, so, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so this is, this is his GAR uh, picture, which again, uh, uh, the library has all of these. They're fantastic pictures. The GAR was the Grand Army of the Republic, which is what the veterans of the Civil War, how they referred to themselves. Uh, we had a thriving chapter here in Hopkinton, the Phillips chapter, for decades. We also had a thriving Women's Relief Corps here in Hopkinton who were you know, supported the war, the Civil War. Uh, women did an enormous amount of work uh, through nursing and uh, making uniforms. All of the individual units, all the individual volunteer units from Massachusetts and other states had their own individual uniforms. And their, their wives and sisters and cousins and everybody else made them. And they made socks and they made blankets and all of those things. And they would send the stuff to where their, where their families were. Hopkinton's Women's Relief Corps lasted for a very long time. Again, the, the history of Hopkinton in the Civil War, we know, has recently been, we, we recently heard a, a talk on that and a publication of a book on that. Um, if you ever want to find out some more fascinating things, particularly about the Irish in Hopkinton in the Civil War, just go down to Wilson Street and mosey around amongst the gravestones in that old, um, in that old cemetery. It's fabulous. And you know, one of the Thomas Featherstone, who was uh, killed at Gettysburg, is buried there. He was a Hopkinton native. So some other industries in town we had at this time, we had the Coolidge Carriage Manufactory in Woodville um, at this time period. And then um, the other major thing were the box factories. We had at least three or four box factories in town. Only makes sense, right? You've got to ship the shoes in something. So there were box factories. There was uh, Phipps on Grove Street, which is where the water tower is now. It's at the curve in Grove Street. There was the Claflin Box Company. There was the Croker Box Company, the Keys Box Company. The Keys Box Company was next to the depot. And the depot, as I said, was in Davins, at Davensport Block there, where Main Street Auto is. So, um, so Keys was right next to it. Only makes sense, right? You'd be, you'd want to be right next to where you could load the goods onto the onto the train. So, what happened? What happened to all of this? Where did it all go? Well, there's really no one answer to that. I mean, some of it, some of it has to do with, of course, the fires in town. The fires really devastated Hopkinton, particularly that 1882 fire. Um, we also know that, um, you know, one of the things too, and, and people have written about this and talked about this before, um, but the, through the three fires, 1876 is the first one, 82 and 1900, Hopkinton fire apparatus consisted of hand pumps only, hand pumps only. And it's not until after that third fire that town meeting finally votes to pay for more modern, uh, you know, water, uh, firefighting equipment. It's like 1906 when they first get their first truck in Hopkinton. Um, it, it, the other thing, so there are, there's evidence that Daniel Thurber Bridges, he left town because of the lack of fire equipment. Um, whether or not that's an accurate assessment or not, I'm not 100% sure, but you know, the town wasn't really willing to put money into it until after that third fire. Um, it, it, you would hope that they would have learned, but it took them a while, I guess, to figure it out. Um, the other thing, too, is the rise of unions. People just didn't want to deal with the unions. And again, we go back to that idea that these were single owner-operated businesses. These were not corporations with boards and, well, they might have had boards, but they were individuals who owned them. And they were all, you know, related to each other, and they all, as I said, set wages and prices and all of that. 
So once the Union started to ascend to some kind of power, in the late 1890s there was actually a Boot and Shoe Workers International, which was part of the AFL. So they went from the Crispins to the Knights of Labor to this Boot and Shoe Workers International. They just didn't want to deal with them. There's an interesting anecdote um, from a woman who wrote this great piece on um, notes. It's here, it, it's here at the um, Historical Society, notes from the industrial activity in Hopkinton, Massachusetts. Her name was Suzanne D. Ward. And it's actually, it's very, it's really well done. She sorts out how they're all interrelated to one another um, and you know who owned all the factories and, and the times and, and the years and everything. Um, she looked into this, she tried to figure out some, uh, whether or not the unions played a role in the downfall of industry here in town. And she said that during her research, another townsperson told her that her uncle, uh, a worker at one of the factories, was a proponent of unions. And if necessary, the use of strikes to obtain better working conditions. He was sitting on his porch one day when a strike breaker walked by on his way to work. The uncle kept his head down, and as the man walked by, he said, scab, rep repeatedly. Such was the tension in town that the uncle was arrested and brought to court on the charge of slander. He was released on the charges when he told the court that he was not calling the man names. He was merely talking about a healing cut on his hand. <laughs> <laughs> this, <laughs> this story passed quickly through town and was chuckled at or sneered at, depending on which side of the industrial fence you were on. And uh, this author, Suzanne Ward, said, I do think this story points up the strong and often bitter dissension between the established townspeople and the Irish Catholic factory workers in the late uh, 1800s. Um, the other one major point that happened was the abandonment of the railroad line here in Hopkinton. And that particular, uh, you know, particularly was devastating to the box factories who were still in existence after the shoe factories left, but as we know, they were, they were pretty much gone too by the turn of the last century. All right, uh, so first off, can you tell us uh, what got you into this research? Well, I've always been interested in women and work, and for my doctoral dissertation a very long time ago, I, my research was on the Lowell Female Labor Reform Association, which were women in Lowell in the 1840s who were working for a 10-hour workday. This was long before suffrage, long before women had any political power at all. And these women actually uh, petitioned and marched and spoke before the legislature trying to get a 10-hour workday enacted. What other towns have you uh, done this research in? Is it primarily in Hopkinton or is it all over? I know you said you did a lot of research in Lowell. Uh, is it throughout Massachusetts? Basically throughout Massachusetts. So Lowell, Lawrence, um, also Clinton, Barrie, uh, Milford, um, Hopedale. There were factories all over Massachusetts at one time or another. I've also done a lot of research in western Massachusetts on Irish immigrants in the paper mills and the textile mills out there. Now what towns would you say have the most history as, as far as the factories and the industry? Well, actually it's kind of interesting because at one time or another they all had mills. They all had factories. We generally think now of the big cities like Lawrence and Lowell and New Bedford and Fall River. Uh, Brockton was a major shoe center as well. Uh, just about every town in Massachusetts had industry at one time or another. Now, how long does it take you to research a specific town? Hmm, depends on what the topic is. I don't think your research is ever done. I, as I said, I published a, a book chapter on the Lawrence strike a few years ago, and I'm still finding out more about it, even after I finished my work. I'm uh, a professor at Stonehill College, and if they go on Stonehill College website, they can find my resume there, and it lists all my articles and publications and things like that.